Europe, a familiar sight. But the continent hasn't always looked the way it does today. It needed gigantic forces to shape the land and its coasts. Masses of ice and water. It seemed like there was nothing more to discover about the old world. But spectacular scientific discoveries have changed the way we look at Europe. Without the ice ages, it would be a very different continent today. As we know it. It's hard to imagine what it looked like once upon a time. But if we turn the clock back a few thousand years, the continent is hardly recognizable. Four hundred and fifty thousand years ago, an ice sheet several kilometers thick covered northern Europe. At its edge, the meltwater carried by large rivers, such as the Rhine and the Thames, flowed into a huge meltwater lake between France and England. From there, it pushed south to a huge limestone barrier that ran between what is now Calais and Dover. It dropped over the edge in huge waterfalls and carved deep plunge pools into the rock. Four hundred and fifty thousand years later, it is these pools that give scientists the crucial clue as to which natural disaster once occurred between Great Britain and France in the middle of what is now the English Channel. At Imperial College in London, geologist Sanjeev Gupta has examined the seabed. What we discovered was extraordinary because we see these giant holes that are carved into rock in the center of the Dover Strait that are now filled with sediment and the only explanation the only way that we can find to make these is that we had huge waterfalls. Here we have plunge pools that are tens of meters deep. This plunge pool here is 90 meters deep carved into the bedrock and several hundred meters wide. These are giant plunge pools that require huge forces and a really large waterfall to create them. What they told us was that the rock ridge must have extended all the way from southern England, southeastern England, all the way to northwestern France, from Dover to Calais. And secondly, that the water that supplied these waterfalls must have come from a lake, a giant lake that lay to the northeast in the Southern North Sea. The volume of water must have been immense. The reservoir had had around 2,000 years to fill. The remains of the Great Barrier can still be seen today. In France, they are the chalk cliffs near Calais. In England, the white cliffs of Dover. Gupta's discovery immediately raised new questions. The question is, how did that gap that we see between England, France and the sea, the English Channel, come to be? It's normally been proposed that slow erosion, slow wearing back off these cliffs created that gap through geological time, but new findings from under the sea reveal how that gap was created. What we see is a, a sort of gorge-like features that's been carved into the rock and has smooth sides and has a whole series of features which are telltale signs of erosion by mega floods. 
the speeds of water, there must have been tens of meters per second flowing through these uh, canyons that we see carved in the floor of the English Channel. So it would have been really, really dramatic. We would have been watching that waterfall erode with our own eyes, basically. It might have only taken a few weeks for the barrier to completely disappear. All that remains are the cliffs of Dover and Calais. Once the dam had disappeared, people and animals could only reach Britain during the Ice Ages when the water level fell low enough. Before then, the straight-tusked elephant used to make it to the British Isles regularly during warm periods. Scientists recently excavated one of its skeletons in Schöningen in northern Germany in a decommissioned open cast mine. 300,000 years ago, this was the shore of a lake. Its sediment preserved the fossils so well that they can still tell their stories today. The straight-tusked elephant was slightly larger than today's African savanna elephant. It reached a size of up to four meters. Nelly, the female elephant we excavated, was a bit smaller. We assumed that Nelly was in her mid-50s and that she died of natural causes. It is a common phenomenon with elephants that when they are sick or very old, they like to walk in water because it carries part of their weight. So it is not unusual that an elephant dies on the bank of a lake. That is rather common. The worn down teeth of the lower jaw reveal its age. The bones allow conclusions to be made about the world in which the elephant cow lived. On the bones, we have found bite marks of animals. There are distinct holes in the bones from which we conclude that large carnivores have made them. We need to remember that at that time here in Europe, in northern Germany, there was a great richness in species. Nowadays, we have only three or four large mammals. At that time, there were over 20. Besides the elephants, there were wild horses, aurochs, and also rhinos, bison, and many more. Those elephants that lived here were not exotic at all. The temperatures were similar to today's, and they would still be able to survive here today because they had fur, and their fat and circulatory system were adapted to the habitat. These elephants would feel right at home here. This elephant species lived almost exclusively in Europe. In the warmer regions, it even survived the Ice Ages. From these pockets, it was able to repopulate the north again and again. Every warm stage and every ice age, there were many mammals in Europe, Asia and North America. Almost all of these became extinct, or became almost extinct, when we, the Homo sapiens, the modern man, moved into these areas. Their extinction certainly had something to do with our behavior, otherwise they would still be around. When the limestone barrier between Great Britain and France came down 450,000 years ago, large parts of northern Germany and Denmark were a long way from existing. Northern Europe lay under thick ice. This was advantageous, as Schleswig-Holstein and Jutland would never have existed without the ice. Only a few places that exist today were around back then, like the Kalkberg in Bad Segeberg. The geologist Miriam Pfeiffer knows why. 
Schleswig-Holstein and Jutland consist of debris that was brought here by the glaciers of the Scandinavian ice sheet. These glaciers reached as far as Britain. At their base, they scraped the rock and carried large amounts of rubble with them, which they piled up to what is now Schleswig-Holstein and Jutland. The furrows that scar the mountains in Norway give an idea of the force with which the rocks were abraded. The ice took rubble and stones of all sizes and transported them like a river to northern Germany. A large part of the material that once filled the fjords completely can now be found in Schleswig-Holstein and Jutland. Without the glacial deposits, Schleswig-Holstein would be covered by sea today, and only a few islands would protrude. One of them is the Kalkberg here in Segeberg, but also Herligoland and the Mosum Cliff on Zilt, particularly these islands, because they were pushed up by underground layers of salt. The debris traveled all the way to Great Britain 300,000 years ago. After that, the ice gradually melted back. Nevertheless, it left behind not just one pile of rubble, but quite a few in a row, the so-called terminal moraines. The ice has not simply expanded and retreated uniformly, but has retreated in many steps and in between moved forward again. So by doing that, it left several moraines behind and produced a very typical chain of hills, which today forms the Schleswig-Holstein hill country. At the end of the Zala glaciation 126,000 years ago, Schleswig-Holstein looked just as hilly in the west as it does today in the east. It would stay that way for about 60,000 years. For the animals, the melting of the ice meant an increase in habitat. As soon as the ice was gone and the climate was a little bit warmer, they spread to the north. The straight-tusked elephant, for example, made it to the island of Thun in Denmark. Reindeer herds roamed the whole of Schleswig-Holstein. They were more flexible than the elephant and could already conquer the country when this was only a cold and barren tundra. The archaeologist Mara Julia Weber has researched the distribution of reindeer in Schleswig-Holstein. Reindeer lived in the North European plain because here they found good living conditions. It was a tundra with herbs and some lichen, which are especially important for reindeer in winter. That provided the food they needed. It was actually a very typical reindeer habitat, as you might find it today in Canada or on the fells in Norway. Or in Scotland. There used to be reindeer here too. However, they had been extinct in these parts until a private initiative reintroduced them in 1952. Elizabeth Smith runs the project and knows how important these animals are to the people of the North. The reindeer that are in the Northern Hemisphere, throughout the subarctic and Arctic, Basically, man would not have moved to these areas unless reindeer were there. Reindeer provides man with everything. It provides them with a source of food. In many tri tribal people, a source of milk. The skins are used for clothing. They're used for tents. They are basically the farm animal of the north. In the permafrost tundra, living off reindeer has always been one of the few options for long-term survival. Hardly any other animal can handle the cold so well. Reindeer are a truly arctic animal. The first thing is they have an amazing coat. Every single hair is hollow. 
And that's really important because actually air is a very good insulator. So when a reindeer lies down on the snow, for example, they don't melt the snow they're lying on. They don't let the heat out and they don't let the cold in. Reindeer have about 2,000 hairs per square centimetre, even under their hooves. And they have another trick that protects them from cooling down. They have an interesting countercurrent system, which is the warm blood that's coming away from the body is passing cold blood coming away from the extremities and there's a crossover. So the warmth goes back into the body and their extremities, when you take their temperature at their extremities, it's, it's lower at their legs than it is within the body. So they're conserving heat all the time and that's really important to a reindeer. While humans have to increase their metabolism below 25 degrees Celsius to stay warm, this limit for reindeer is minus 40 degrees. However, they often have a hard time finding food underneath the snow. The diet of a reindeer changes quite dramatically through the seasons. And in the winter time, the reindeer almost solely eat lichens. And this is a fungus uh, with a symbiotic relationship with an algae, and it grows on the ground. It's one of the only things that's still growing under the snow. And reindeer will use their lovely big feet to dig down through the snow to the lichens below. In order for them to do this, their hooves transform depending on the season. In summer, they have soft cushions. In winter, they are hard and angular so that they can scrape up ice and snow. And the eyes of the reindeer can adapt as well. They change their color so that the animals can find their food more easily. While the reflective surface behind the retina is yellow in summer, it turns blue in winter. This causes less light to be reflected and increases the contrast in the twilight of the polar winter. So a light green lichen in white snow looks more like a dark gray lichen against a white background. Sixty thousand years ago, the ice came back. It was the beginning of the last ice age. However, this time it didn't travel as far as the last time. In the middle of Schleswig-Holstein, the glaciers came to a halt about 25,000 years ago. A wall of ice stretched in a wide arc from Poland to Denmark. The glacier was actually part of a huge ice sheet. We only see the foothills. Here the glacier was about 300 meters thick. That is already enormous. In Scandinavia, it was more than 3,000 meters thick higher than the Matterhorn. All the time there was snow falling on its top, which froze over and added to its mass. On its way down here, it continuously lost mass due to melting. So here you would only have some foothills. When the glaciers reached eastern Schleswig-Holstein 25,000 years ago, they pushed up new ramparts of debris. This eastern hill country has been preserved to this day. But back then, such terminal marines still existed in the West, too. They were remains from the previous Ice Age. Today, there's no trace left of them. Where did they go? The Western Hill Country originated from older glacial deposits, and these were simply washed away by the meltwater of younger glaciers. This meltwater formed mighty rivers. They had a lot of energy and could simply wash away both coarse and fine components so that they were completely removed. The water distributed sand and debris on wide, flat, outwash plains, so-called sanders. This process can be simulated in an experiment. 
The coffee grounds are intended to show how sediment is distributed when meltwater emerges from the glacier. The ice cubes are the melting glacier, which is the source of the meltwater. The water represents the meltwater. It flows very quickly and reaches very high energies, which enable it to break through the marine. The coffee grounds show where the fine sediment of the glacier is distributed. You can see it is spread over a wide area and that the water is transporting it a long way. But wherever the water runs a little slower, the sediment is deposited and these wide, flat sanders are formed. So due to this process, all the marines from the previous ice age in the west of Schleswig-Holstein disappear. The sandy outwash plains become the high geest, which is a name for barren land. Beyond that lies the marshland. It is this vast and cold Europe where the first modern humans migrated to about 40,000 years ago. Germany and France are largely tundra. It's so cold that there is an animal living here that today can only be found north of the Arctic Circle. The snowy owl. Its traces can be found in southern France. These birds seem to have made an impression on the people of the Ice Age. It's the hunters of the so-called Magdalenian culture who live in France. Some of their rock carvings are said to depict snowy owls. In the Rock and Mador area, the temperatures often rise to more than 30 degrees in summer. It's hard to imagine that people once hunted reindeer here. And sometimes, even snowy owls. Scientists are still wondering why these people hunted the birds in the first place. After all, there was little meat on an owl. Archaeologist Veronique Laroulondi is looking for an answer. In general, remains of snowy owls are rather rare. But during the Magdalenian period, there are sites where hundreds or even thousands of bones were found. Hunting snowy owls was not very efficient. The hunt used up energy but returned little nourishment. Might the birds just have been prey of opportunity? Snowy owls were not killed out of necessity or by accident. Hunting this species was a deliberate decision of the people of that time. Food was sufficiently available to them in the form of reindeer. In the valley of the door lies the cave of Kom Kie. This place might help to solve the mystery of the snowy owls. Many artifacts from the Magdalenian era have been found in this cave. Among them were a lot of reindeer bones, but also bones of snowy owls. Snowy owls don't live here anymore. After all, the landscape was very different back then. There was hardly any vegetation. The land resembled the tundra. It might have looked something like this in France back then. However, it seems like there weren't any snowy owl chicks living in the regions of the hunters. We've only recovered bones from adult owls. I'm assuming that the birds only migrated here for the winter time. In their wintering grounds, they would not have brooded. Snowy owls hatch their young in late summer. Only then will they find enough lemmings to raise the chicks. Today their breeding areas are far away from their wintering grounds. At the National Prehistoric Museum in Les Aisies de Tayac, Veronique Laroulondi examines the 30,000-year-old snowy owl bones. From the way the hunters processed the bones, 
the archaeologist can conclude that they were not necessarily after the meat. Under the microscope, we can see numerous tool marks of stone knives on the bones. These are extremely meticulous works. And some bones were decorated with ornaments. But these people had a very special interest, which leaves us puzzled. They were particularly interested in the claws. They detached them and took them along on their migration. The reasons are still a mystery to us. Whatever the reasons, people invested a lot of time and energy in processing the snowy owls. They must have had a very special relationship with these birds. Whoever is lucky enough to observe one of the last specimens of this species might be able to understand the fascination for the white owls. Even in the world of the Ice Ages, there were seasons. And it's not just the snowy owls that spent the winter in a different place to the summer. The reindeer also moved north for the warm season. Reindeer herder Elizabeth Smith knows the migration flows of the animals. Reindeer react to the season because it's a change in, in vegetation, a change in diet. Once the spring starts coming, the reindeer move north with the advance of spring. So every time they move north, there's a little bit of fresh, new vegetation to browse on. Once they're up there, they'll spend time there grazing before they start making this progress back down in the autumn during the rutting season and back to their winter grazing again. In the same way, Reindeer herds moved through northern Germany during the Ice Age. They were followed by hunters of the so-called Hamburg culture. Archaeologist Mara Julia Weber and her colleagues excavated one of their tent camps in North Frisia. These people were hunters and gatherers who were constantly moving throughout the year. They didn't stay in one place, but they went to certain places at certain times where they expected good hunting conditions. We are assuming that these people planned exactly when and where they would be able to easily hunt reindeer. With reindeer, it comes in handy that their herds on migration have relatively predetermined routes. The people at that time knew how to make use of this, especially Ahrenshöft as an example where we have about 20 sites of the Hamburg culture in a suitable place for hunting. This is certainly not a coincidence. That is something we're seeing over and over again, that the campsites were located in such places where you would have something like a bottleneck, a narrow valley. For the drive hunt, there are examples from Greenland that have inspired our idea of how hunting was done here in Ahrenshoft. We are assuming that whole families came here together. For a drive hunt, that would have been very useful. Everyone had a role to play, and everybody was important for the success of the hunt. Reindeer have bad eyesight but a good sense of smell. So you would have to position yourself in such a way that they weren't able to detect you from far away. Then there is one part of the group that makes noise to drive the animals into the bottleneck. <laughs> the 
There is another important characteristic of reindeer. When the herd leader has made it through the bottleneck, the rest of the herd will follow. This is actually the important moment. And that is where the hunters are waiting to take the animals down from the side and from behind. In this well-organized manner, you have to imagine a hunt taking place. Of course, the survival of the group depended on the hunt. The hunters of the Hamburg culture. Traces of them can be found in the Netherlands, Denmark, Poland, and even Scotland. And they apparently visited a rock that today lies far out at sea, Heligoland, Germany's only offshore island. During the last ice age, the red monolith sat on dry land, connected to the mainland. And where its sandy sister island lies today, a second mountain overlooked the plain with white cliffs made of limestone and gypsum. The rock bore real treasures. Flint, large nodules from which tools and weapons could be made. And the Heligoland flint had another special feature. Inside, some of the nodules were not grey, but red. Whether the colour made the stone particularly valuable to the hunters is unknown, but they transported it over long distances. In the 1990s, a hobby archaeologist found this processed stone from Heligoland in a field near Lake Duma in Lower Saxony. The archaeologists Stefan Weil and Jana Esther Fries have examined the finding. We call such a piece a lithic core. It is a stone made of flint. By hitting this core, thin strips would detach the so-called flakes. From these flakes, the actual tools were created. Therefore, a lithic core is the raw material from which one would make as many flakes as possible. After that, it would be rubbish and would get discarded. Tools like knives, refined from those flakes, only lasted a limited time before they wore out. First, I'm going to remove the cortex. In Albersdorf, Schleswig-Holstein, museum education officer Werner Pfeiffer is trying to learn about Stone Age techniques by using experimental archaeology. Oh, this is a beauty. It's important to hit the core at a certain angle. If I hit it down straight, the energy would run this way into the stone and break it apart completely. In order to detach a slim flake, I have to hit it from this direction. If I do so, the energy will travel right underneath the thin layer, and the result will be a long and thin flake. Temporarily, Pfeiffer often lives the everyday life of a Stone Age person and knows their daily needs. If a lot of flakes were needed at once, I would use up the core completely and nap all the flakes I can get. Within a few minutes, the job would be done. But if only two or three flakes were needed, I would keep the stone for later, because when you use the flakes, for example, when cutting meat, they get blunt very quickly. And, of course, they are the sharpest when they come straight out of the stone. The display of precise technology changes the way we look at the simple Stone Age man. This is another nice one. 
A person who can nap wonderful little flakes out of a stone must not be stupid or clumsy. This work relies on a lot of skills, and above all, it has a lot to do with communication. You learn this skill over a period of many years. Of course, anyone can knock one stone against another and somehow get a sharp edge out of it. But in order to purposefully create flakes, which have a very specific shape, those people had to be at least as intelligent as we are. Flakes made from Heligoland flint. They are rare. In the whole of northern Germany, there are only around a dozen Stone Age artifacts made from Heligoland flint. Tools from the grey flint are quite common. The archaeologists working with Jana Esther Fries find them regularly. The lithic core from Heligoland is something very special. The special thing about it is that it was found in Dummer. This lithic core must have traveled from Helegoland to Lake Duma. That is quite unusual. Of course, this immediately raises the question of how it got there. Has anyone walked from Lake Duma to Helegoland to find something like this? Did people from Helegoland travel to trade these stones for something else? Did it go through several hands? That would also be a possibility. After all, Heligoland is about 200 kilometers away from the site near Dama. At the time, this was a considerably long distance. The search for clues resembles detective work. There is a small indication that the core was passed on through several hands, because it has been intensively worked on and revised several times. All of it could have been done by the same person, but that is not so likely. Whoever collected the stone from Heligoland probably transported it a short distance and then passed it on to someone else. We are assuming that people of that time lived together in very small groups that could have been a family or maybe two or three families who stayed together permanently. And we reckon that they might have met with other people every now and then, perhaps at regular annual intervals. At these occasions, things were exchanged, news was told and knowledge was passed on. This might explain how the Heligoland flint could have changed hands. Through these exchanges, the use of techniques can spread over extremely long distances, and materials can be passed on over several hundred kilometers. It's obvious that they have met, otherwise the documented exchange of knowledge, material and technology could not have happened. So indirectly we can conclude that there were networks, even in these times, which we always imagined to be very, very simple, people were in contact over very long distances, and this find from Dama is proof of that. About 15,000 years ago, Europe began to get warmer, especially in summer. The whole continent is changing. What used to be tundra is slowly turning into a bushy steppe. It's not a dense forest, because the herbivores move north too, along with the plants. Europe is full of large mammals that keep the landscape open. Wild horses roam in large herds. Red deer are still solely living in the steppe. And there is one animal that has long puzzled scientists. The European bison. There was no trace of these large mammals in Europe until about 12,000 years ago. Where did the bison suddenly come from? Archaeologist Gilles Tossello recreates the most famous caves in France. He has come across a wide variety of bison representations. 
The differences in bison in Stone Age art from 40 to 10,000 years ago are quite pronounced. Especially the size of the shoulder area shows differences, as does the length of the horns, which can be larger or smaller. For Tosello, these differences are not just the whim of Stone Age artists. The bison in the cave drawings can be roughly divided into two categories. The main differences become apparent when we compare the two bison types we find in cave art. So here we have a bison with a long body and rather small horns. It can be easily distinguished from his cousin because that one has much higher shoulders and, above all, huge crescent-shaped horns that stick out a long way from the head. For a long time, these differences were simply dismissed. One could say the artistic skills of Stone Age people were not taken seriously. That only changed when a research team from the University of Adelaide subjected fossil bison bones to a DNA test. Looking at the cave paintings, we have always assumed that they were a result of free artistic interpretation. The surprising thing now is that these representations actually are not so much based on interpretation, but show two different species that are reproduced in a relatively lifelike manner. One of the species is the now extinct steppe bison. The other one is a close relative of the European bison. The exciting thing is that the fossil findings before 11,000 years ago never showed any European bison at all. Scientists had always wondered what was prior to that. Before that time, there was only findings for the steppe bison. The European bison came out of nowhere, so to speak. With the scientists' discovery, that was about to change. As a result of the study, we discovered an unknown lineage that we called Bison X. What really surprised us about the genetic analysis of the new Bison X was that, on the one hand, it was somewhat similar to the steppe bison genome, but on the other hand, it also had similarities to the aurochs. About 90% steppe bison and 10% aurochs. And we were able to tell roughly how the crossbreeding took place. It was male steppe bison that mated with female aurochs about 120,000 years ago. And this happened even though the auroch males likely guarded their herds as well as this bull does. It belongs to a group of Taurus cattle, which are said to resemble the aurochs. The pedigree seems resolved. Male steppe bison mated with female aurochs and sired the line of the so-called bison X, from which eventually emerged the European bison. The steppe bison became extinct around 12,000 years ago. The aurochs followed in the 17th century, when the bison X was already long gone. Today, only the European bison is left. Europe's largest land mammal has become rare. Only a few individuals are left in the wild. The reindeer hunters who followed the animals towards Denmark in summer spend the cold season in Doggerland, the vast plains between Germany and Great Britain. But this year, a catastrophe is looming off the Norwegian coast. It will change Doggerland and Europe forever. And it will also have its effects on the British coast. Geologist John Hill 
reconstructed the steps that led to the disaster some 8,000 years ago. Off the coast of Norway, there was a huge underwater landslide. This, it's hard to imagine how big this landslide was. It was 3,000 cubic kilometers. If you want to take that amount of sediment and place it on the UK, you would cover the entire of the UK with 10 meters of sand. So this one landslide, as massive as it was, generated a tsunami that then impacted the entirety of the North Atlantic and the whole of the North Sea at the time. The scientists used a computer model to simulate the course of the tsunami. So what we can see as the slide uh, moves down slope is a positive wave heading off towards Greenland and that goes incredibly quickly about the speed of a jumbo jet flying across there. And then we also see the negative wave coming back towards Norway. And then the wave from Norway then heads down uh, the North Sea. It would have been two to five meters high when it hit the low-lying land of Doggerland at the time. So you can see the blue, which is the wave coming out, and then this large red wave, which is the incoming positive waves washing over the, the island. And then there's a bunch of smaller waves that come back. This tsunami could have been absolutely huge. It could have uh, inundated 30 to 40% of the island. If there were coastal communities uh, living on the north edge of Dogland at the time, they would have experienced a huge amount of water. The Dogger Bank was overrun completely, and the waves also reached the coasts. If they were living there, it would have been quite a traumatic event, I would imagine. Well, one of the things we do know about uh, the tsunami, it probably happened in the autumn. Uh, we found mosses in Norway and cherry stones in Scotland that both indicate that the sediments left by the tsunami were deposited during the autumn, October to November probably. Now, that is going into the harshest time for any Mesolithic community, so into winter when there's no food around. So if it had destroyed their fishing or their caches of food, uh, it could have been a really harsh winter. Combined with the melting of large ice sheets in Canada and Europe, the tsunami was devastating. The water continued to rise and Doggerland sank into the sea. The warming of Europe continues. Where previously was tundra, forest is now slowly spreading. More and more rain falls instead of snow. This is a problem for the reindeer. Their fur insulates so well that the risk of overheating is greater than that of freezing. Scientific experiments on a treadmill have shown that the animals can control their cooling in three stages. In the first stage, they accelerate their breathing rate to 260 breaths per minute. The passing air cools the blood in the sinuses, which is pumped back into the body. If that's not enough, they pant like dogs with their tongues hanging out. The evaporation cools the blood in it, and the blood flow to the tongue can even be increased for more efficiency. However, if the brain's temperature approaches 39 degrees Celsius, it becomes critical. At that point, there's a third stage where the body directs cooled blood from the nose into a network of blood vessels in the head. Here too, the animals have a heat exchanger. The cold blood cools the warm blood that flows from the body to the brain. In their cold habitat, this cooling system is sufficient should they have to make an escape from a predator. But in Central Europe, where the temperatures are rising, it doesn't help much. Here, they disappear. European bison can take the heat much better than reindeer. They are struggling with a different problem. The steps in which they graze are slowly being taken over by scrubland and forest. They manage to adapt. The steppe dwellers 
turn into forest animals. The ice has largely disappeared from Europe, but the face of the continent is still changing. The coasts of the Baltic Sea shift their course several times. Geologist Miriam Pfeiffer looks at the water-filled Flensburg Fjord, reflecting that it was dry land back then. These canyons and fjords were formed by glacier tongues that moved from Scandinavia to Germany and scraped away a lot of rock. When they melted, they left gullies that later filled up with water when the sea level rose again. It has only been 7,000 years that the Baltic Sea has its current shape. Four hundred and fifty thousand years of alternation between warm stages and ice ages. A lot has happened since the break of the dam between France and Great Britain. Europe, a continent shaped by the ice ages, a gift of the glaciers. The people have changed their strategy. Instead of being hunters and gatherers, they are farmers now. Unable to get their vitamin D from hunted prey, their skin tone has become lighter to produce vitamin D from the sunlight. With the shift to agriculture, the birth rate is increasing. Hunting alone could no longer feed everyone. Now there is no going back to life as hunter-gatherers. No going back to the world of the Ice Ages. Crash and crumble, melt and tumble, change.